Okay, like I said, this is, uh, well, here's a tool bed I found in the uh, toolbox. This is what it's going to look like here, except this one's a little wider than we need, 75 thousandths. So, uh, first thing I'll do is, it uh, already has a little side clearance on it here. So on, on the left side, or the left side, so I'll do the same thing on the right side and uh, take it down to a sixteenth. I want to make sure when I grind it, it's, it's a little bit tapered. So it's a sixteenth on the outside and it tapers in a little bit behind for clearance in the groove that we're going to cut. So let's go ahead and do that and true the wheel up here. Sixty-eight thousandths. Remember, this is a two-place decimal. There's nothing critical about it. That should be pretty close. And 66. Sixty-two, that sounds like about a sixteenth of an inch. Now let's just put a little radius on the nose of it. Something like that, and that's all it takes. Where are we at? There we go. Okay, so we'll just plunge this in and it'll cut our groove under the head. And while we're here, we might as well grind the, uh, the radius for the end of the, of the bolt. Um, we need a, uh, where are we at here, one inch radius on the, on the end of the head, so we need to grind a form tool for that. And again, digging around the toolbox, I found this one. It's, uh, where are we at? There we go. Um, it's a form tool, it's not, not a one inch radius like I need. Easiest way to do that is just grab a piece of uh, bar stock. This is a piece of two inch round. I want to grind a one inch radius, so this that'll work perfect. Well, you know what? That's pretty darn close. And it's a little bit bigger than two inch, so I'm just going to grind the end of this this form on here till it fits this piece of round stock, and we'll call it a day. a little bit small. I'm just using the rounded corner of the wheel. Just kind of freehanding it. I'm going to make it as smooth as possible because you're going to reprodu be reproducing this shape on your part. So you want it to be 
pretty smooth. Okay, that's pretty darn close. Just hold the thing up to the light, look between the tool and the piece of round stack, and you can see where you need to grind. So, uh, that's pretty much what it looks like. Got a little clearance on the end, you know, a little clearance on the... We don't care about the sides, because we're not going to be using that. This one looks like it was cutting something on the side, but we don't care. We're just going to be plunging it straight into the end of the part. All right, so that takes care of that. Let's go back to the lathe and put it to work. Okay, so let's cut that uh, groove first. That'll be cut right in here like this. Doing a little math from the print, I know that the, uh, the left side of this groove is 380 thousandths from the end of the part. So I'm just going to bump the end of the part with the tool, move over 380 thousandths, and then go in. And I know this groove is 5 16 diameter at the bottom, and we're starting out at a half an inch, so we need to go in uh, 3 16 of an inch once it touches the outside diameter. So we'll touch the end, move over 380, touch the diameter, go in 188, and we should be good. make sure that the uh, top of the tool is the form tool. It has to be on center. Most tools have to be on center. That looks good. So let's uh, turn the lathe on. We're going to run, run this, want to run this pretty slow so we don't get a lot of chatter. And just come up and I'm going to angle that tool bit a little bit more. It's not quite... We want only to touch on the uh, the end of it. We don't want it to touch behind. So let me correct the angle a little bit. Like that. Okay, just touch the end. Use my carriage stop. And we want to go in 380 thousandths, about there. Now we'll run it in until it bumps the diameter. And set my dial to 188 before zero. So now we just plunge in to zero and we should be good to go. Use lots of oil on these form tools like this so they don't grab. It's like parting, right? Just like that. That's what happens when you push it too far, too fast. Okay, luckily the part spun in the chuck a little bit, so it didn't break the tool off. But it probably moved, so let's get it re-centered or realigned. Take it a little slower. And I'm also going to check and make sure that okay, that didn't tool's good there yet, so let's just uh, 
finish it up here. That's better. Okay, so I forgot to turn on the camera. That's always a good thing. So we almost missed the second second groove. This one was a little more successful. Okay, so that takes care of the grooves. Okay, for the next operation, cutting this one inch radius on the end, I, I decided to use a, a bird's eye view give you a little better idea of what's going on. Um, this tool bit's a little narrower than the part is in diameter, so it's it's a little tougher to line up. If it was if it was larger than the part, all I'd have to do is set it square to the part and then just adjust it in and out until it cut evenly on the front and the back, or touch the front and the back of the part at the same time. But since it's narrower, you got to kind of work with it off center a little bit. So I just set it on an angle slight angle like this and we'll work on the more toward the front of the part. And we'll just, when we start cutting the radius we'll just uh, line up the back side by eye as we go. It is just an aesthetic radius so it's not critical as long as it looks good when it's done that's all we care about. Um, make sure your tool is centered vertically because if it's above or below the center line of the, of the part it's going to leave a little nib. We don't want that. Um, form tools, there's a lot of a lot of the tool in contact with the work at once with the form tool, so you want to make sure you run at a very slow speed, slow RPM. So I'm going to set my lathe as slow as it'll go. And we'll start lining this thing up. Just kind of ease it in. It'll cut on the front side first. And as the radius forms, you want it to uh, finish up on the center. About the same time it touches the back side of the tool. Yeah, I think I'm a little bit above center. Doesn't want to cut, so I'm gonna drop it down a little bit. A little more. There we go. All right, a little bit of oil. And that's it. Not much to it. But it does make the part look a lot nicer. Let's go ahead and switch over and do the other one. We're all set up now, so just put a little oil on it and plunge it in. Okay, that's all there is to that. Now one last thing. I'm going to go in and uh, put a small chamfer on all the uh, corners. Just to make that look pretty. Just knock the sharp edges off. I think, uh, not sure if I called out a chamfer size on these corner of this uh, flange here or not, but it's just, it's just aesthetic, so we'll just knock the corner off, take the sharp edge off, and move on to the next phase. I always keep a uh, 90 degree uh, chamfering tool on hand here. I use it a lot just to knock all the sharp corners off parts your machine or your turn. It helps to uh, have it far enough out you don't hit the chuck.
Okay, so now let's move over to the mill and uh, we'll cut some, we'll score up this head and that'll finish up the machining operations. And then from there we'll go on and heat treat. Okay, I forgot to uh, show you guys how these uh, radii turned out in the last segment, so here it is. This is what it looks like. It uh, doesn't take much to do, but it sure improves the appearance of the part. So there you go. So let's move on to this, uh, cutting this uh, square head on these things. There are a lot of ways we can do that. We can uh, put a dividing head on the table here and, and mount the thing vertically in the dividing head. And side mill index 90 degrees each time, side mill index, side mill until we get around our four sides. Um, we can hold it horizontally and end mill. Um, that'll work as well and index it four times 90 degrees. Uh, problem with end milling is you're going to get a rougher, rougher surface finish than if you side mill. So I think probably we ought to stick to mounting the part vertically and uh, side milling it. Um, probably the easiest way to do that is to uh, just use a, a collet block. These things are, you can get square ones, you can get uh, hex shaped ones. Um, all they do is hold a 5C collet, whatever size you need, and they have a little, either a locking ring, or they also have these, these cam lock things. If you have a lot of parts to do, you can set one of these up, and it's just lever, lever operated, actuated. But uh, for this one, I think we'll just use this thing and set it up vertically in the vise. Just lock it in here. These things are meant to take a uh, spanner wrench. And somewhere in the world, I'm sure there's one that fits this, but not in my shop. So we'll just use a pair of pliers to lock it down. Um, use a uh, B block here next to it to get it vertical. It's not real critical, but it's nice to get get it somewhat vertical anyway. Like that. And then I've got a half inch end mill mounted in here. So I'm going to have to reset my camera angle. Let's zoom in a bit so you can see what's going on. Okay, now figure the RPM for a uh, half inch end mill on 01 tool steel. Figure a cutting speed of uh, 60, uh, 120 divided by half. It's the same thing as it was on the lathe, about 500 RPM. Half inch diameter stock or half inch diameter tool doesn't make any difference. So let's slow it down. Now I'm just going to adjust the end mill vertically so it centers up in that, that uh, groove we cut. Okay, all I'll do is uh, take a clean up cut on one side here. Then we'll flip it around 180 degrees without moving anything on the dot on the dials. So now we can mic it and see where we're at. We have uh, 469 thousandths. So it means we have 94 thousandths to go total, or 47 thousandths per side. So now I'm going to set my dial or my readout to zero on the y axis. 
and we'll take off another 47 thousandths. like to take a uh, rough cut conventional and then finish cut climb milling. Climb milling leaves a better better surface finish. Okay now we can sw switch it around end for end or flip it 180 again and clean up the first side. Then we can go ahead and just do the rest of them. about uh, five thousandths for the rough cut, or for a finished cut I mean. All right, let's see how close we got to three eighths. Okay, we're 374 and a half, so that's, that's pretty good. All right, flip it 90 degrees. It's a lot quicker than using a setting up and using a dividing head. Side milling like this leaves a much nicer finish than end milling if you did the part horizontally. So that finishes this one up. <clears throat> Let's pop it out and see what it looks like. Okay, we got a nice, nice square head on it now, the radius end. Should make a nice looking screw for the, the carriage stop. So I'll go ahead and do the other one and then we'll uh, get busy and heat treat these parts. Alright, so let's get the other one squared up.
one tends to mill a lot nicer than it turns. You can get a nice turn finish, but it takes a little more effort. Always looks good milled. That's about it. Let's see what it looks like. <clears throat> yeah, let me zoom out a bit here. There we go. Okay, that's looks pretty nice. Nice square head bolt finished on the top. So look good on the carriage stop. So uh, next in line, we'll uh, move over to the bench and do a little heat treating. See you there. So let's talk a little bit about uh, heat treating. It's been a long time since I've taken a metallur metallurgy class, but I think I can remember a little bit about it. Probably enough to get myself in trouble, but uh, let's give it a shot. Um, carbon steel at room temperature is made up of, has a grain structure in it um, that's made up of... Uh, Ferrite, which is uh, basically the element iron, and cementite, which is uh, a chemical uh, called uh, iron uh, carbide. And also a, a, a mix of the two that makes up something called perlite, okay, at room temp. And uh, as we heat this, as this steel is heated up, this uh, cementite and perlite um, once you reach the point of uh, the lower critical stage, what it's called. Actually, I can show you this. This is the uh, iron carbon diagram. Okay. You look uh, down here, you see um, this center line here is called a eutectic steel. It's 0.85% carbon. And at this, at this uh, carbon percentage, um, the steel is made up in, entirely of perlite. The ferrite and the cementite are balanced out and they're all converted into perlite. Okay, that's called eutectic steel. On the left side of the chart here, um, this, this steel has an excess of ferrite in it and a mix of perlite. This is called hypoeutectic steel. And on the other side of the, of the 0.85% dividing line there, um, you have an excess of cementite. This is called hypereutectic steel. Okay, as this, uh, well, our steel here, our O1 is 0.9% carbon, so it's a hyper-eutectic steel, falls right about here, okay? And as, you, as this uh, steel is heated up, where's my pointer here? Okay, as the temperature rises, this cementite and perlite in here, once it reaches this uh, lower critical point here, which is 1345, I think, 1345 degrees, um, this cementite and perlite starts changing over to something called austenite. Okay, and the higher it gets in this in this temperature range here, um, the more this cementite and perlite changes over to austenite until you get above this up into this range up in here, and it it becomes entirely austenite. Okay, now if you just reverse the process and just stop heating it and let it cool down slowly back to room temperature, all this austenite that formed will convert back into the original cementite and perlite and you'll end up with some soft steel again. Okay, that's 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 the, the basic behind the basics behind annealing. If you heat it heat a part up, if it's hard at room temp, you heat it up above this lower critical point, let it air cool back down, the austenite will convert back to uh, cementite and perlite, which is a soft soft steel. Now if once you if you heat it up above this lower critical line 
and if you cool it at a at a controlled rate or or faster it's called a critical rate if you if you cool it at the critical cooling rate or faster this austenite will convert over into something called martensite okay and it'll it'll remain so you won't end up with a mixture of of uh, cementite and perlite anymore it'll be a martensitic grain structure which is very hard and uh, well that's that's the basics of, of heat treating okay you heat it up to a, above this lower critical point and you cool it at a, at a controlled rate in this case with oil okay uh, water will harden it too but water has cools it too fast and it'll make uh, it'll make it well for one thing the, the steel can fracture it'll uh, if you cool it too fast it'll crack so oil is the approved or the the best quenching medium for O1 because it uh, cools it fast enough to make the steel hard but not so fast that it'll, that it'll crack so let's uh, let's heat these parts up and uh, quench them in oil and see if they get hard I'm going to use an uh, oxyacetylene torch here you can use uh, I don't, I don't know if a propane torch will put out enough heat to heat up a part like this. We have to get these, like I said, about 100 degrees over the, the lower critical stage, which is 13, I say 1345. We have to get it up to about 14, 1445 or so, which is uh, kind of a bright red. It's a lot of heat for a propane torch. It's hard to decide. And the idea is to get the whole part a nice bright red. Because if you leave some of it uh, cooler, it won't reach that uh, hardening temperature and it won't get hard when you cool it. You gotta get the whole thing a nice cherry red. I usually start start on the thicker spots. Kind of watch the color of it as it goes. You also don't want to overheat it. But for one reason, it creates a lot of scale on the part, or it can create scale. And another reason is it'll it'll make for a, a large grain structure, and the part will be uh, weak, not be as strong. So we're starting to get some color now. All right now we're about up to temp. Nice red, red color, so let's quench it in the oil and get it back down to room temp or close to it. So you don't want it, you want to stir over, you want to agitate the part around because you don't want it to get um, stagnant in there. You want, you want the oil to be exposed to it all, all around and uh, cool it as, as quickly as possible. If it cools too slowly, You'll end up with uh, cementite and perlite in your, in your uh, uh, grain structure and the part won't be hard. Okay, now, what we have here now is a part that's about Rockwell 65. It's very hard. And like I said before, for a bolt, we want to have, want to have a little bit of flexibility. We don't want it to be super hard. So uh, now I'm going to go ahead and temper it. I'm going to heat it back up to about 450 degrees and let it uh, air cool. And one way to do that is to take your part over and polish it up on the way and get some, uh, get some uh, clean steel showing so you can heat it up and watch the color of the steel. Um, a straw color is about 450 degrees, but an easy way with oil is you just burn the oil off of the torch. As soon as the shine goes away on the part, that's about 450 degrees and then that's, that's the tempering temperature. That's what I'm going to do on this. I'm just going to burn the oil off of the torch carefully. I don't want to get it too hot because I don't, I don't want to kneel it and it pulls back down. So we just carefully burn it off and watch the oil. And when the shine goes away and burn the oil off, that's about our, that's our tempering temperature. Then you just let it air cool.
this has the added benefit of making the part black. It's a nice black finish on it. You can see the oil starting to go away on the on the tong, and it's starting to change on the part too. Okay, the oil's about all gone now. I'm gonna get on the head here. Okay, that part is up to its annealing temp. You just lay it down and let it air cool. That'll take some of the hardness away. Like I said, it should take it down to about Rockwell 60 instead of 65. A lot more, still hard, still file hard, but it has more flex to it. So it won't break. Get it up to a nice, nice red color, evenly, and quench it. Swirl it around so you close the parts to, to cool oil. So it cools at that recommended rate, that critical cooling rate. Go ahead and tap it. Don't get too hot in this tempering business, so you gotta really watch the oil. As soon as the shine starts going away, back off. That's about it. So here we are 10 minutes later, and the parts have cooled down, obviously. I'm holding them, holding them in my hand. Thought you guys might like to see what they look like when they're finished. Pretty nice looking parts. Nice shiny black finish on them. Um, O1 is wonderful stuff if you haven't have, had the opportunity to work with it. It's you know it's it's a little challenging to machine because it's hard, a lot of carbon in it, but uh, you can make really nice looking parts out of it. And when you're done, you can you can harden them. You know, every, anytime I put a lot of work into a, a tool, I like to harden it up so it uh, you know it has good durability and it, it'll be around. It's not gonna look nasty after you use it for a few times. So that's it for the uh, the clamp bolts. Um, next time, next video, I promise, will be uh, final assembly of the carriage stop and we'll move on to, a, to another project. See you then.